to you all. I'm delighted to introduce this afternoon's speaker. Eduardo Cadaba is a professor of English at Princeton University and has faculty affiliation across a number of departments and programs at Princeton, including comparative literature, Spanish and Portuguese, the School of Architecture, the Cedar Center for Hellenic Studies, and the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies. He serves on the executive committees of the programs in Media and Modernity, European Cultural Studies, and Latin American Studies. Eduardo is a faculty member in the summer program at European Graduate School in Saspi, and he has been the Benjamin Mitchell Distinguished Visiting Professor in Architecture at Cooper Union. From 2009 to 2017, he was the head of Wilson College, Princeton's first residential college founded in 1957 in the spirit of integrating academic, social, and residential life on campus. And which continues to be a six decade tradition of promoting student governance and diversity. During his tenure as head of the college, Eduardo was also the curator of the Wilson College Signature Lecture Series. Eduardo is author, co author, translator, editor, and curator of a rich and impressive body of work. In Emerson and the Climates of History, Eduardo tells us that there is no sentence in Emerson that is not touched by the weather. This line is his point of departure for an inquiry into the pervasive language of mediation and mediality in Emerson's writings, language linked to broader questions concerning the nature of history and thought, but also, and perhaps most importantly, to the question of America itself, that haunted question of America's constitutive elements always situated between a fixed place and a future destiny, between fact and dream. Indeed, the book's central argument relies on a re-reading of Emerson's recourse to the weather, to climatic and meteorological metaphors, which are inseparable from his reflections on the historical and political issues of his time, issues traversed by the conflictual histories of slavery, race, revolution, destiny, and both the meaning and making of America. Working his way meticulously through Emerson's corpus, Eduardo's sequential close readings find their center of gravity in the following claim. History is something to which we can never be present. What the book stages, in effect, is an approximation toward understanding history as a dual process of occurrence and flight, of events and their ephemerality, the fleetingness of which will become the locus of both interpretation and experience. If, as Eduardo's reading of Emerson will suggest, writing history is making history, then the task before us, the task of reading and criticism, is not one that adheres strictly to the laws of representation, but rather one that embraces the act of writing as a tracing of history's own transitive nature. But somewhat differently in this work, Eduardo invites us to remain faithful to the ways in which history is always and necessarily ecstatic. To adopt an understanding of history as something that stands outside itself. Such a beautiful and challenging invitation is also a provocation for us as contemporary readers to remain faithful to the ways in which language, without which there would be no past or present, always and inevitably moves away from itself too. This invitation, which I have also labeled a provocation, continues in his seminal work, Words of Light, Theses on the Photography of History, a rigorous thinking with and thinking through the, writing, the writings of Walter Benjamin, Words of Light, reveals Benjamin's concept of history, a concept based on history's citational structure to be grounded in the logic of photography. Written as a kind of homage and memorialization of Benjamin's own fragmentary, discontinuous, indeed photographic prose, Words of Light articulates an inextricable link between the language of photography from the flash to the arrest and a concept of history unbound by linear time. It does this remarkably through a reenactment of the theses for which Benjamin is so well known, the same theses that operate in Eduardo's words as photographs in prose, in which stage a certain correspondence between words and images, between language and photographic snapshots each mediating, potentiating, and transforming the other in a kind of philosophical relay between the steadiness of historical analysis and the force of interruption that every image bears. The signature of this work, 
the sequencing of the 29 snapshots and crows that comprise words of light aims then to preserve the memory of any own pathetic method of writing. The task in such a preservation is to think in fragments, to evoke a pattern of philosophical inquiry that elicits the formation of constellations as a strategy for mapping the traces of what remains of history in the present moment. Eduardo is the author with photographer Fuzzle Sheikh of the monograph Fuzzle Sheikh portraits. Their continued collaborations have taken place through exhibitions, writings, and as many of us here today saw at last week's colloquium, the publication of erasures, the accompanying catalog in the form of a trilingual newspaper to the exhibition of the same name. He has co edited several volumes, including Who Comes After the Subject, Cities Without Citizens, a special issue of the South Atlantic Quarterly titled Injustice for All, The Claims of Human Rights. And he has co-produced and co-edited a DVD entitled Unpacking Derrida's Library, with recorded commentary by Judith Butler, Lindsay Sue, a very young man to freeze, Abitel Rennell, Ayatri Spivak, and Samuel Butler. In the itinerant languages of photography, another co-edited, co-curated project is where it tells us that photography is never just one thing. It's always multiple, always shifting, always other than itself. This multiplicity and multi-directionality, which defines photography, can be traced back to the destabilizing force of arrest, the stasis that paradoxically gives the image movement. To think the medium's mobility is to wrestle with its own restlessness, to attend to the transience that arguably underlies every photographic image. No small feat, but perhaps in part an explanation for the opening line of Eduardo's text in itinerant languages, photography is mad, he writes, even insolent. This madness is linked to the fact that it refuses to stay fixed, and this refusal, or refusal that marks photography's very mobility, stands as the signature shape of all photographs, what Eduardo refers to as their relentless and restless migration across worlds, the irresistible movement of which displaces, transposes, transforms, and reproduces uh, as it circulates. Indeed, what Eduardo's work locates is the wild itinerancy of the heart of photography, the motion inherent to the poetics of picturing the world that locates time and light and looks to discover the mechanisms, the language by which, and here with T.S. Eliot in mind, elusive stillness turns shadow into transient beauty. An insight which for Eliot, as for Eduardo, can only occur at the still point of the turning world. The claims about photography are many in this project, but perhaps the most striking among them is this, that there can be no death of photography, no last image. At the core of the contemporary debates in new media, digital technologies, and data database imaging systems, lies the very structural philosophical foundation of photography, the relation between original and copy, memory and monetization, identity and difference, relation and representation, survival and death. Such that working from a place of itinerancy, what we learn is a way of harnessing the volatility of images. We learn, in fact, a method for activating images and of putting into action the thought that arises with the practice of being photographically Itinerancy, then, in the context of photography, is also intimately connected to a mode of instigating thought through images, a philosophical and political gesture that finds in images what Hannah uh, Arendt called the activity of thinking. Eduardo's curatorial works are numerous and ongoing. He has co-curated installations and exhibitions at the Maxi Museum in Rome, the Sloth Foundation in Philadelphia, Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York, the Alma Mall Center for Contemporary Art in East Jerusalem, and the Princeton University Art Museum. He has also translated several works by Derrida, Le Coulevard, and Rancheau, and recently he co-translated Philly Sandra's memoirs, the English title of which is When I Was a Photographer. In his introduction to this translation of the Dari, tenancy and movement persist, as Eduardo tells us, that the labor of reading images, of reading dialectically, involves reading the then in the now, a task demanding that the reader follow the wandering, deviating quality of the text. Nadar's memoirs in this instance are rescued in service of photography, 
in order to articulate the kinds of thinking that photography generates and the kinds of relations it enables. Hence, Eduardo's meditation on ghostliness, mourning, archival practices, memory, perception, allegory, violence, and desire. Meditations that aim to situate photography as a form of visuality that seizes upon times of assessment for coming and disappearing. His book, Paper Graveyards, Essays on Art and Photography, is forthcoming from Princeton University Press. He's currently working on a collection of essays titled Of Mourning and Politics, and is writing a small volume on the relation between music and techniques of reproduction, memorization, and writing called Music on Bones. He's also co-directing with Neil Weissman a multi-year project on the relation between political conflict and climate change under the name Conflict Shorelines. There can be no philosophy without photography. Indeed, to think the contours and vicissitudes of philosophy, of history, one must think photographically. One must engage with the language and logic of photography. Eduardo's work, all of it, teaches us this. But the work also teaches us is that photographs ask us to think in ruins, to approach the image decisively, but delicately as a ruin. This is because all photographs ask us to think the remains of what cannot come under the present, to question, and here I quote Eduardo, how an event that appears only in its disappearance can leave something behind that opens history. His talk today is titled, Learning to See, or Reading Historically in Moments of Danger. Please join me in welcoming Eduardo Vidal. Okay, thank you very much, Patty, for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, can you all hear me back there? No problem? Okay. Um, it's an honor for me to be uh, speaking in this context today, and I thank all of you for your presence. Um, the pages I re I'm going to read today are drawn from a small book I'm writing on the photographic work of Susan Mizellas. Uh, Susan has been a Magnum photographer since the mid-1970s, and she's presently the president of the Magnum Foundation, a foundation that's dedicated to supporting young photographers from around the globe. She's perhaps best known for her work in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Kurdistan, and because one of my permanent interests the last several years has been to think about what it might mean to read historically, especially in moments of danger, I've returned to her work to see what kind of resources I might find there. Uh, the book is written in the form of a letter to Susan, uh, but uh, my presentation today will not be epistolary in form. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar uh, everyone is uh, with her work, so there are just a few things that I want to say that I think will help as uh, I speak, since I'm going to make references to these uh, details, and this way you'll have a sense of what I'm referencing. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, when I first began working on this book last summer, I discovered an early project of Susan's, which, was, which she published in 1974 under the title Learning to See. Uh, Susan was teaching in the Bronx in New York, and she put together a book composed of 101 exercises, experiments uh, that use photography and that you can use in the classroom to teach children how to see. And so I realized that this was a book, actually it's a, a training manual on how to see, and then I realized that all of her books, all of her projects are training manuals on how to see. So what I'm doing in the book is I'm taking five of the exercises in the book, in the book Learn to See, alphabetography, before and after, photo swap, doorways, and traces. And I'm using them as a kind of lens through which to read the rest of her corpus. Today I'm going to focus on photo swap, uh, but I'll make reference to alphabetography. Uh, alphabetography is the first exercise in the book Learn to See. And in it, Susan just asks children to find letters of the alphabet in objects in the world and even in shadows, like an O, for example, in the rim of a cup or a bowl. Uh, it's a way of getting them to, to read letters, read the alphabet in the world. Um, in PhotoSwap, she asks two groups of children to uh, take photographs and then to swap them, to exchange them, uh, and then to take uh, these images and put them in pairs and form diptychs, basically, of images taken in different places at different times. 
And then she asks them to invent a story that explains uh, why one can put those two images together. So uh, the other detail that I want to mention is that uh, Susan goes to Nicaragua uh, and documents the Nicaraguan Revolution. I mean, any image that you know of the Re Nicaraguan Revolution is Susan's, I, be I bet. She returns 10 years later to, basically she brings the book that she had made on the basis of the images she took during the revolution. Uh, she puts a book together called Nicaragua. And she brings the book back 10 years later and looks for the people that she had taken photographs of. So she basically walks around with the book, pointing to pictures and trying to locate the people. And she films this uh, return and makes a film called Pictures from a Revolution. Um, 25 years later, which is to say 15 years after um, this first return, 25 years after her first trip, uh, she goes back and installs mural size images of the images she had taken uh, in 7980 in the places in which she had taken them. And this project is entitled Reframing History. So those are the things I think you, those little details will help you. Uh, one final remark, um, there are three images that I'm going to be showing that are, are potentially difficult images to look at. Uh, the first is a, a half-eaten torso on the Cuesta del Plomo hillside in Nicaragua. This is perhaps one of Susan's most famous early images from the project in Nicaragua. The second is an image of a man trying to retrieve uh, the incinerated ashes of his son. And the third image is an image of uh, the massacre of El Mozote in San Sa El Salvador. Okay, I just wanted to uh, alert you to those uh, three images. Okay. That's it. Um, I'm going to begin. Uh, and because I was writing these pages, um, as I was organizing a memorial for Werner Hamacher, uh, I would like to dedicate my lecture today to his memory. Um, partly because he was someone whose work uh, and whose friendship uh, helped me to learn to see uh, and even to read. Okay. I begin in the conviction that it is impossible to view Susan's work in the present without an understanding of how this work is mediated by everything that came before. And how it even takes mediation as one of its primary traits and sites of exploration. It is precisely Susan's sense of the mediated character of experience that allows her to explore the relations between images and history. She notes the way in which our perception is always mediated by our history, the way in which our eyes can mostly only see through the histories and relations that have helped compose them, when she speaks of how inevitable it is that we carry our history wherever we go. Speaking of the moment in which she moves from Latin America to Kurdistan and of the relations between what she sees in both places, she explains, this is the first uh, passage on the handout, I carry these themes with me without even recognizing it. And I'm attracted like a magnet to the mass graves, destroyed villages, the missing, the themes and issues I've been involved with for the last 12 years. I had gotten to the point where there was context and continuity in my Latin American work, and I knew the history of the place I, places I was in, and suddenly I was pulling myself out of that and landing in a place I knew absolutely nothing about. But I brought that other history with me. What she suggests is that like each of her photographs, perception is always full of memories. Indeed, we would in fact be entirely unable to encounter anything without our memories, even if it is precisely these memories that often make it impossible for us to see what is before us in all its singularity. While these histories and mediations are of course multiple and heterogeneous, I want to recall one of Susan's earliest projects, a project she put together in 1974, I'm thinking of her wildly interesting project, Learn to See, because I want to suggest that its mediatory presence within her work has been mostly, and I think unjustly, neglected. I believe that if read properly, it can serve as a key to unraveling many of the traits that are so legible throughout all of her work. Indeed, the series of photographic projects that comprise it delineate a network of strategies and protocols that have persisted, even if in different forms, throughout her career, right down to the present day. My instinct, in other words, is that in offering a series of 101 different experiments and exercises that use photography both inside and outside the classroom, in order to encourage us to see things differently, to see things we might not otherwise have seen, and even to see more profoundly and deeply, 
Learn to See is a kind of training manual on how to see in general. And for this reason, I wish to suggest this early project tells us what is true of all of her books and projects, each of them, including Carnival Strippers, Pandora's Box, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Kurdistan, but also all the others, are themselves training manuals on how to see, on how to read images, and especially in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Kurdistan, on how to read images historically and particularly in moments of danger. In the brief time I have with you today, I want to turn to one of the experiments in Learn to See in order to demonstrate what I mean here. I want to begin with the seriality of photographs, with the fact that every photograph belongs in a series and that it is even fissured from within by its own seriality, by its ties to other images, relations, and histories, but a seriality that must be understood in terms of interruption rather than succession. This seriality will enable us to think about the question of the distance and proximity between befores and afters. And what will mediate this reflection is the exercise she developed with her students entitled PhotoSwap. Linked to other experiments and learn to see, this exercise is very much about the stories we tell or invent in relation to the images before us. What is at stake in this exercise is the possibility of creating a narrative that can account for the link between two photographs taken at different times and in different places that can offer a story that brings them together, one after another, but sometimes with an after that not surprisingly is already associated with a before. And in so doing allows us to say something particular about these two images and something about photography more generally. I first thought of this particular exercise in relation to a diptych that Susan drew from a contact sheet from one of the rolls of film that she shot in 1989. This diptych belongs to a series composed entirely of diptychs that she considered together under the title From Home to the Field. I love the formal organizing principle of this series. Susan decided that she would interrupt a roll of film wherever she was in it, and she would not take another picture until she had traveled somewhere else. In this new place, she would take an image, and then she would form a diptych composed of the last image she took in the last place she had been, and the first image she took in her new context. Then, like the students in her photo swap class, she would try to think about what might link the two images taken at different times and at different place, in different places, about what words might account for how these two images came to be alongside one another. If we can come to understand the visual and historical dynamics between these two images, we can perhaps begin to understand the way in which all images interact with one another whenever they are put next to one another. The way in which, never appearing alone, all images demand that we read them in relation to other images and across the distance on the basis of which all relations are established. I want to turn to From Home to the Field and to one of the photo swaps that compose it in order to draw some lessons from it about the activity of reading photographs in general and of reading them historically in particular. The diptych in question is composed first of an image of Susan's family in upstate New York in the summer of 1989, and second, of the image she takes on first arriving in Nicaragua some weeks later to work on pictures from a revolution, an image of a cross marking the very site on which she had 11 years earlier found the Cuesta del Plomo torso. How is it that we can put these two images, these two worlds, into proximity with one another? The most direct answer would perhaps be to simply say, through photography. But to say this is just the beginning of a mystery, since the real question is, what is it in photography that permits us to put these so seemingly distant images alongside one another? And indeed, what happens when they find themselves next to one another? While there's perhaps something accidental about this juxtaposition, it is of course the result of a deliberate experiment, and therefore something closer to a planned accident. This is why we are invited to imagine the motivations behind this pairing, even if some of these motivations remain unconscious. What is perhaps first worth noting is that almost immediately after her arrival in Nicaragua, Susan returns to this entirely overdetermined site, at least in relation to her psychological, emotional, historical, and political investments. This can scarcely be an accident, since as she has confessed, she is drawn like a magnet to sites of disappearance. That this second image evokes the photograph she took of the half-eaten torso 
of a rebel f uh, fighter on the same site in 1978 suggests that this diptych is at least a triptych, a triptych that begins with this mutilated body on the hillside and therefore again unsettles the linearity that we would generally expect to exist between a before and an after. The first image of her family is taken before the second image in the diptych, but after her first encounter with this particular execution site in Nicaragua. To say that the photograph can circulate, that it raises questions about the relation between the past and the present, is perhaps not enough, however, and this is where we might register the real force of her later project, Reframing History. What is necessary is to trace the effects of installing this particular image in this particular site at this particular moment. And this even though a photograph can never have a fixed relation to either its provenance or its later iterations. The force of reinserting this particular image on the hillside in which Susan had found this half-eaten torso 25 years earlier, a well-known site of many assassinations near Managua that were carried out by the National Guard before and during the insurrection, has to do with the force of recalling a body in a landscape that no longer seems to remember it, and at a time when the government and the people also have forgotten much of what took place on this site so many years ago. If the National Guard disposed of, this, of the body here, it was because it wanted it to be seen as a warning and deterrent to other rebels. Taking the photograph in that context, in order to expose the violence of the government by recontextualizing the image within a counter-narrative, is very different than displaying it at another moment and in another historical political context. But in both instances, the aim is to keep this remnant of a body from being forgotten, to keep this singular death and everything it represents from being lost to history. If this reproduction of a lifeless torso is to speak, though, if it is to bear witness to the atrocities it underwent and that also served as part of the context that led to its destruction, if we are to begin to understand everything it represents, we need to reconstruct the history that is sealed within it and that is invisible within the frame of the image. This is why, as Benjamin explains in his 1931 little history of photography, in the long run, it is the inscription or caption of a photograph that becomes its most important feature, since it is what helps us tell this history, since it can become the shifting register of the always changing significance of an image across time and space. In this regard, it is interesting that in a small text in which Susan discusses this image, she tells us that the image was never published in a magazine, and that instead, she felt as if she had to make a book to hold this particular image as one of 71 photographs, that the whole book was made to contextualize this one image." End quote. Among so many other things, this suggests that we can only read an image by putting it in relation to other images, by surrounding it with other materials that together form part of the image's caption, part of the context within which it can be read. We can only read an image, that is, by reading it historically, but without ever imagining that we can fully saturate the context without which we could never even approach it, and this because the image can never be entirely illuminated by its several contexts because it simultaneously transforms them. Every image in reframing history makes this indelibly clear. In order to press this point differently and at the very limits of what can be represented, we could even say that it is this half-eaten body that is the real caption of Susan's photograph, that becomes the secret alphabet that has to be read and given language, that has to be transformed into words and sentences. This means that the three images form a kind of ensemble, which would of course include many other related images and perhaps minimally all the images she published in her book on Nicaragua and that she has stated form the context for her earlier image and therefore have to be read in relation to one another. What is at stake each time is a story about what the eye can see and what it cannot, about what the camera can capture and of what eludes it. To say this, however, is simply to say that our experience of the diptychs that compose from home to the field is always an experience of the eye, of an eye that seeks to see where it does not see, where it no longer sees, or where it does not yet see. But what is it that we see and cannot see in these images? If we follow the protocols laid out in the exercises from Learn to See, 
that teach us to look for visual rhymes across different shapes and forms and even tones and colors, we can begin to invent a story that might help us account for the relations between these images. We might start with the fact that the female figure with her arms outstretched, about to step into the pond, here serves as a kind of mediating form between the different photographs Susan took on the Cuesta del Plomo, the first one in 1978 and the later one in 1989. In the movement from the Y of the torso to the T of the cross, the female body appears as both a Y and a T, and therefore marks the transition between this earlier and this later photograph, a transition that is signaled in the fact that she's about to step into water, which as a force of dissolution and transformation, perhaps anticipates and even facilitates her disappearance into the cross in the next image. There are several other formal elements to which we can pay attention as well, but I will only mention three here. First, there's a kind of visual echolalia between the shape of Lake Managua in the distance, in the image on the right of the diptych, uh, I'm talking about the, the right image, the sort of oval shape of the lake on the upper right side, and the shapes of the ripple circles around the two water spouts that emerge from the pond in the middle image. There is even a second circular shape in the plane below the cross in the Nicaragua image. Second, the lighter toned landscape in the area closest to the cross and extending into the plain and the darker curl of the hills in the upper left part of the photograph are a visual rhyme of the lighter color of the water closest to the woman and the darker tones of the water as it moves away from her and especially in the upper left part of the photograph. Third, the frame of the diptych's first image includes a cut-off torso on its right edge behind the standing woman which references, at least in the context of my suggestion, that this image is haunted by its relation to the image that is to come and to the one that precedes the diptych altogether, even if only obliquely and in a displaced fashion. The torso and arm in her earlier image, a torso and arm that get reattached in the cross that simultaneously marks their absence. As a result of these relays, there are several exchanges or swaps that take place between the photographs. Water is exchanged for a landscape. A female figure is swapped for a cross. A cross has appeared in exchange for a body that is no longer present. A living fragment of a body appears as a substitute for a half-eaten torso. Circular bodies of water seem to cross the borders of a picture's frame. And given that rebels were disappeared on the hillside, as well as along the shores of Lake Managua, a commemorative marker shares its work with a body of water that is both a grave and an always shifting activity of remembrance and forgetting. In addition, an image that presumably is more closely associated with a sense of home for Susan, since it includes a number of Susan's family members, is exchanged for an image that is more distant from whatever Susan might call her home. But as a result of the exchanges that take, take place here, the presumed familiarity of this proximity to her family is interrupted by the intervention of the image that follows it and that introduces a darkness and death into the earlier image's more idyllic setting. In the same way that the torso she finds more than a decade earlier introduced death and disappearance into the beauty of the Nicaraguan landscape. This play between life and death, between tranquility and devastation, inhabits each of the images we are considering and in so doing, undoes the stability of the home referenced in the title of this project and therefore makes it impossible for home to refer to a single unambiguous site, something that is reinforced by all the other homes that are the starting points of Susan's other diptychs. Indeed, the, the multiplicity of these several other homes not only suggests the mobility of her sense of home, which could indicate that she either does not have a fixed sense of home or that she is able to find a home nearly everywhere, but also as a counter to this, the way in which the one constant in every one of these diptychs, the one thing that remains in each of them, is her relation to photography. As if she has found a sense of home in relation to her camera, and perhaps even in its itinerancy. This would suggest that the trajectory from home to the field is not really a qualitative shift, since the field has become a kind of home for her, as much as all the different homes from which she begins in this series suggest that her home 
is never simply her home, but always something else, something always in the process of being made. To begin to formalize the lessons that can be drawn from this rather remarkable diptych, I would like to say that the fact that every detail here can potentially become exchanged for another one, and even more than one other one, for example, the female figure can become a cross, and then by association, the missing body to which the cross refers. Suggests the continual distortions and displacements from which the photographic detail or subject emerges, but always as an other. This movement of disfiguration, linked to the chiasmic plurality of the image's interwoven figures, makes it impossible to isolate the images from each other. In addition, where everything can become something else, nothing is ever just itself because figures are always haunted by other figures, are always bearing the traces of the other. They are always themselves and not themselves at the same time. What gets signaled here is not only the structure of photography in general, a structure that names simultaneously the affirmation and loss of identity that attends the entry into a photographic space, but also a mode of creating images that performs at the level of its details what it wants us to understand and achieves this whether it does so consciously or not. Indeed, that the two images that form this diptych belong together is confirmed for me not simply by the reading I have offered here, but also by a very beautiful series of sentences in which sense Susan discusses the moment in which she is making pictures from a revolution. The moment, of course, when she makes the second image of this diptych. In these sentences, she not only steps into a body of water, just like the woman who steps into the water in the diptych's first image, but she also registers the power of history to move her in directions she perhaps did not expect, to proceed without her, and because of this, to introduce a sense of loss that perhaps leads her inevitably back to the site where so many years earlier she had taken the image of the Cuesta del Plomo Torso, since this site is linked to a history that she can clearly never leave behind and will always include, include her. In these sentences, she says, and there's the second passage on your handout, embarking on the kind of journey I did through Nicaragua and El Salvador is a bit like stepping into a body of water, the depth of which is unknown until you take the plunge. There's the tension between how deep the water is and how far you're willing to explore. You can be overpowered by a current and lose your balance. I know there were times when I allowed myself to experience that. The pull of history is powerful, but at some point one has to rebalance, recalibrate, get to the other side of the river. Pictures from a revolution is the point where I pull myself out of the river. I'm on the bank at the other side. I'm looking at the end of the story, at least my part in it. It's going on without me, and there's a lot of sadness." End quote. What this diptych triptych tells us is that reading images historically involves reading them in relation to other images and histories, tracing in the one image the disfigured and transformed traces of the others. Each of these photographs becomes an event in the other ones, repeats itself in them, even as its repetitions are only the return, the virtually infinite return of what is never the same. It is in the possibility of being able to, or being able to read these relations and differences that we can begin to register what we might mean by the historical dimension of images. This is why we must read an image in relation to what precedes and follows it, and why the task of reading historically demands that we not only trace the manner in which a photograph shares some of its elements with other photographs, how it is situated within a particular general historical context, how it is inscribed in a series of images and relations, but also what remains idiomatic in the image, how it confirms this context even as it betrays it, even betrays it, distances itself from it, in order to respect it. What Susan's diptych tells us, especially when viewed through the lens of photo swap and of all its related visual exercises, is that what enables us to read images is our capacity to invent a story, a skeletal narrative, not a thin light outline, however, but a deeply archival, material, and embodied account of how these images are articulated that can bring together histories that are at least as invisible as they are visible, and that can join images taken at different times and in different places in ways that can open up their historical and material secrets. <laughs>
If we follow these protocols, understanding that in each instance they have to be reinvented in relation to the specific context within which we are working, we can begin to read images across Susan's corpus in new, unexpected, and I believe wildly rich and productive ways. For example, reading the visual rhymes between different forms and shapes permits us to think about the relation between these two images. The image on the left was taken outside of Masaya, Nicaragua in 1979, and it documents the government's insistence on searching everyone traveling by bus, truck, or foot to see if any link could be established between the travelers and the Sandinista rebels. The image on the right was taken in El Salvador in 1980, and again documents a moment in which bus passengers are being searched and interrogated by the National Guard, this time along the Northern Highway. As in the earlier image, the soldiers are looking for evidence of any alliance or sympathy between the passengers, and in this instance, the FMLN guerrilla movement. If in the one, Susan photographs the passengers directly, however, in the other, she photographs them indirectly by looking not at them, but at their shadows. This exchange of bodies for shadows is significant and speaks to the difficulty of looking directly at the brutality that was so evident in El Salvador at this time, and that, as Susan once said, was much more difficult to look at than anything she ever saw in Nicaragua, including the Cuesta del Plomo torso. The shadows are at the same time threshold figures that casting their outlines on the wall imprint a play between presence and absence that would become the signature of the military dictatorship's forced disappearances. In the move from passengers to shadows, the shadows announce the potential disappearance of the bodies. The bodies seen in the first image and the ones referenced indirectly in the second one and point to the fear and precariousness that define the everyday experience of the people who found themselves under the right-wing military regimes that governed most of Latin America through the 1970s and 1980s. A means of eliminating opposition and terrorizing the population at large, disappearances erased a person from both life and death, even denying relatives a body over which to grieve. Without dead bodies, the government could deny knowledge of people's whereabouts and any accusations that they had been killed. As Argentinian dictator General Jorge Rafael Videla stated in a now infamous press conference, they are neither dead nor alive, they are disappeared." End quote. If the juxtaposition of these two images permits us to think about the kidnappings, the torture, the murder and disappearances of tens of thousands of people all across Latin America, they also permit us to think more precisely about the relations and differences between the way in which these different forms of violence manifested themselves in Nicaragua and El Salvador during this same period. I also believe that the second image may never have been produced if Susan had not already taken the first one. This is to say that the image she took in El Salvador is haunted and mediated by the image taken in Nicaragua. It would not have been possible for her to take the second image without having the first one in mind, either directly or indirectly. And this again reinforces the sense of how we always carry our history with us, of how our eyes are composed of everything we have seen and how it is only through these mediations that we can begin to see at all. While this pairing is perhaps more easily legible, since both images tell a story of bus passengers being searched, even if one does so more indirectly, this attention to formal visual rhymes also permits us to see relations between images that do not immediately share this kind of thematic proximity, as I already have suggested in relation to the diptych from Susan's From Home to the Field project. It becomes possible, for example, to begin to read relations between images such as these three here, drawn from Susan's work in El Salvador and Kurdistan. The first image depicts a firing range in Usulatan, El Salvador, which was used by the US-trained Atlacatal Battalion. Taken in 1983, the photograph presents a series of rows of silhouetted figures in a landscape, with every silhouette a representation of a person who can be targeted and killed. The second image, taken in June 1992, presents the new cemetery of Gotapa, where villagers from mass graves were reburied. And the third image, also taken in 1992, presents a field in northern Iraq dotted with anonymous graves of children killed in the Anfal campaign. 
I want to put these images alongside one another, not only because of the formal relays between them, the exchanges that are legible between the silhouetted targets and the grave markers, for example, with an increased disorder in the latter, latter's placement as we move from left to right, invite us to read these images in relation to one another, but also as a preliminary way of answering a question Susan once asked me. In a discussion about the relation between her different projects, she at one point said that as she moved from El Salvador to Kurdistan, she changed continents, but she then asked, what is it that remains the same? In many respects, my discussion of Susan's photo swap exercise and of the way in which it permits us to think about how we might read the relations between images taken at different times and in different places has been a way of beginning to respond to this question. Now, by placing these images from El Salvador and Kurdistan next to one another, I can perhaps be more precise, at least, at least in regard to these images. One thing that remains the same in this particular shift from El Salvador to Kurdistan is not surprisingly Susan's attraction, or minimally her camera's attraction, to documenting violence and exterminations, disappearances and mass graves. If the, image of the, if the image of the firing range points to a moment of preparation, a moment of the anticipation of targeted killings, the two images of grave sites mark the moment after different murders and disappearances and embody more sober moments of remembrance and commemoration. There is a kind of silence and serenity to the three images, despite the references to the violence and killing that took place either before or after the moments in which they were taken. What also remains the same then is not only Susan's insistence that many of the most important things about a photograph are invisible in it, are outside of its frame, even if they have nevertheless left their traces in it, but also the very real commitment on her part to exposing the traces of injustice wherever it incurs, whether in Latin America or in Kurdistan or really anywhere. As I've wanted to suggest, this commitment corresponds to the political promise of a mode of reading that begins in the exchange of images and histories from different times and places in order to help us imagine ties and relations where we might never have imagined they existed. But this gesture of making history with photographs begins in a very modest way, in the recognition of the capacity of a photograph to serve as a kind of memorial for the disappeared. There is a beautiful series of images in Susan's Kurdistan project in which photographs of the disappeared are worn in their memory. This is perhaps one of the most beautiful of them, an image of family members wearing the photographs of Peshmega martyrs in the Siwan Hills Cemetery in Arbil in northern Iraq. There's something very simple but very moving in this image, and I simply wish to leave it here suspended, like a kind of pendant that rhymes with the images pinned but floating on the clothing of these mourning women. I would dare to say that everything I have suggested today is sealed and encrypted in this image, waiting for us to read it and to unpack its several worlds together. Everything is here which is to say that everything is also not here, beyond its frame, even as we are invited once again to read all its present but invisible traces, traces that would reference without referencing in a fixed and final way all the worlds sealed within it, and of course all the worlds, all the unforeseeably mediated relations sealed within Susan and her itinerant eyes, including those that signal the disappearance and reappearance of subjects, subjects who can never be just one. In order to begin closing my remarks this, uh, the, this evening, I wish to, the, to turn to the question of the trace and to the possibility of retaining a trace of the dead. And it's because of what I would call Susan's love of the trace, her devotion to it, a love and devotion that are perhaps intensified because she, kn she knows it can never be captured or ever be made present. It is always linked to a loss, to something that has passed and is no longer present, to what can never coincide with its presumed referent. In fact, the existence of the trace confirms the absence of whatever left it behind. It is because of her passion for the trace that she is drawn like a magnet to mass graves, destroyed villages, the missing. And this because to love the trace is indeed to love photography, since the very practice of photography begins in its relation to the trace to what is now absent. Indeed, when we have an image in our hand, this is the best indication that what we have in our hands is not what was photographed. 
which is why the photograph is structured around the absence of what it presumably represents and why death and mourning belong to the photographic experience. In particular, I want to recall one of her images from Nicaragua, an image that references the relations among death, mourning, traces, and activities of witnessing, even as it also reflects on the capacities and incapacities of photography itself. As I wish to suggest, Susan is drawn to the scene of death and mourning, not only because of her compassion for life and her commitment to exposing injustice, but also because this photograph is also a photograph of what makes photography what it is and what it is not. The image I wish to discuss, taken in Nicaragua in 1979, shows a father collecting the remains of his assassinated son, who has been identified by a shoe lying nearby. The remains of the sun form another Y, with their outline left on the ground beside it, a kind of ghostly trace of the burnt cadaver the father has so lovingly tried to retrieve. The remains can scarcely remain together or intact and are in a state of continuous deterioration. Already part of the sun's remains have been left behind on the ground. The remains that are meant to reference and memorialize the body of the dead son, in other words, are in the process of disintegrating even further and cannot any longer refer to the son's body if they ever did. They are remains that do not remain. This is why, as Maurice Blanchot noted so movingly in his 1951 essay, Two Versions of the Imaginary, in which he famously identifies the image with a cadaver. This is in the handout. What we call mortal remains escapes common categories. Something is there before us which is not really the living person, nor is it any reality at all. It is neither the same as the person who was alive, nor is it another person, nor is it anything else. If we view this photograph through the lens of this passage, we can conclude that the sun's remains are neither present nor absent. They, are t they testify without testifying, because among so many other things, they testify to the destruction of memory itself. This is why we might say these remains can never correspond to that of which they are supposed to be the trace. I would even go so far as to say that in every trace, and even in every experience, there is this destruction. This experience of destruction, which is experience itself. And I would say the same for the photograph, since it too can never correspond with what is before the camera. There is always so much more in a photograph than what we can see on its surface, and at the same time, never enough which is why Susan always feels compelled to supplement the image by surrounding it with other images and by trying to reconstruct all the histories that are encrypted within it. The photograph itself is never enough, since by itself it can never match what is inside it, and this because of everything that outside it and beyond its frame has left its traces on its surface. In this instance, too, the dead sun, having become an image, even if a material one, the ashes to which the sun has been reduced are themselves a trace, an image of him, just as the photograph Susan took is still an image of him, at least of him as he is now, or as he is not now, has become something that cannot be grasped. As Blanchot would put it, speaking of the cadaver itself, there's a handout, and of the cadaver as a thing to which the one who was once alive has been transformed. It is not the same thing at a distance, but the thing as distance present in its absence, graspable because ungraspable, appearing as disappeared. It is the return of what does not come back. He who just died is at first extremely close to the condition of a thing, a familiar thing which we approach and handle, which does not hold us at a distance. But now he is dead. From behind there will no longer be an inanimate thing, but someone the unbearable image and figure of the unique becoming nothing in particular. It is striking that at this very moment, when the cadaverous presence is the presence of the unknown before us, the mourned deceased begins to resemble himself." End quote. There would be a great deal to say about these passages, but what I wish to emphasize here is that like the remains of a cadaver, every photograph is also the return of what does not come back. It is the trace, the visual repetition of something that even at the very moment in which the photograph was taken, 
is already in the process of becoming something else. What Blanchot suggests is that we do not have to wait until we encounter a cadaver to know that we are always becoming someone or something else. But once we do encounter a cadaver, this truth becomes ineluctable. This is why he suggests we come to ourselves, we come to understand something about ourselves as the ones who are never just ourselves, or at least not the same ourselves from one moment to the next, when we encounter a cadaver. Since it is there in this encounter that we come closest to the mortality that we not only share, but that makes us who we are. It is in this encounter with death that we come to resemble ourselves as mortal and finite beings. It is because we are defined by our mortality and finitude that we are both made and unmade by our images, by the images we are, but also by the images we create. This is why photography tells us we can always only love ruins, because we can always only love what is mortal. In this instance, this photograph of ruin, minimally the record of an incineration, of a dead son, of the body of the dead son, suggests the ruin of the image's capacity to show, to represent, to address and evoke the persons, events, truths, histories, lives and deaths to which it would refer. What makes the image an image is its capacity to bear the traces of what it cannot show, to go on in the face of this loss and ruin, to suggest and gesture toward its potential for speaking. Even as the, tra the trace of the sun's body continues to deteriorate, even when we take a lesson from it about our own finitude, it still remains as a vanishing trace. Indeed, even when an image tells us it can no longer show anything, when it reaches the limit of what it can show, it nevertheless still strives to show and bear witness to what history has sought to silence. This is particularly true, it seems to me, of this next image, which presents victims of the Mozote massacre in El Salvador, which took place on December 11, 1981, just a few weeks before Susan took her picture in January 1982. Rather than pursuing a reading of this image that would rhyme with the one I have just offered, though, in this image, too, the corpses are images of victims who are no longer present, who have been transformed into something in between a person and a thing, who cannot coincide with the image at which we are looking. I here wish to emphasize the way in which the images Susan took of rotting bodies and burnt homes in the Morazan area of El Salvador circulated and eventually became part of the evidence of the massacre, evidence that could be used against the various denials of both the Salvadorian government and the U.S. State Department. Although the guerrillas had announced the massacre soon after it happened, the U.S. State Department claimed that it sent its own investigative team into the area and found no evidence of a massacre. Prompted by this denial and by the continued assertions by the guerrillas and survivors of the incident, Susan went to the area with the journalist Raymond Bonner to document what she could see, which included the charred skulls and bones of men, women, and children, and what she could learn from survivors of the massacre. Published alongside accounts of the slaughter by Bonner and Alma Guillermo Prieto in the New York Times and the Washington Post, respectively, in January 1982, Guillermo Pieto had entered Mozote a few days after Susan and Bonner did, and she also reported seeing the remains of bodies and body parts, and also cited the same survivors. Susan's images were presented as documentation of the atrocities that had taken place during the massacre. Despite these documented accounts of army troops, including mem members of the U.S. trained Atlacatal Battalion, destroying the town of El Mozote and killing hundreds of men, women, and children, however, both governments continued to deny the massacre, and it was not until 1993 that the UN Truth Commission authorized an investigation of the incident. Pressing the Salvadorian government to excavate the ruins of El Mozote's sacristy, where a forensic team found the skulls of 143 individuals, most of them children. The UN in its report concluded, given the limited information it had at that point, that over 200 people had been killed in the incident even though survivors of the massacre claim that as many as 1,000 villagers were killed. Much of this was documented in Mark Danner's 1993 New Yorker essay, The Truth of El Mozote, and in his meticulously documented and expanded book, The Massacre of El Mozote, which was published the following year. But the exhumations and investigation of the massacre have continued to this day, and Susan's photographs are still essential parts. Mm, sorry. It's amazing. I, I, I have given a version of this talk once before, and 
in relation to this image, I had a technical difficulty. Um, but it's okay, you know, we're back, okay. Um, but the exhumations and investigation of the massacre have continued to this day, and Susan's photographs are still essential parts of the evidence being put forward to confirm the scope of the slaughter. I have wanted to recall this sequence of events simply to emphasize that what gets exposed in this process is not only the evidentiary force of a photograph, but also its incapacity to stand alone. Not because the Salvadorian government and the Reagan administration denied what the photograph shows, these denials are scarcely surprising at all, but because its force can only be intensified and clarified when it is inscribed within a narrative. A fact that has circulated in this lecture like a red thread, and that is confirmed on so many fronts by Susan's own insistence on this point. If the photograph would seem to have to be inscribed into a narrative in order to consolidate its evidentiary status, I wish to insist that it was already evidence the moment she captured the scene within the lens of her camera. In this context, this means at least two things. One, that the evidence provided by the photograph can never be understood solely in terms of its relation to the reality to which it presumably refers. Since however referential we may think the photograph is, it can never be decisive or definitive on its own. And two, the evidentiary character of the photograph can never be entirely erased. It remains. These bodies were killed and left to rot. Documenting this is an irreplaceable and invaluable act, regardless of whether or not what is shown is denied, independently of whether or not people act on what is shown directly and decisively. If we say that a body is killed, however, perhaps the question that remains is what it means to say what, that a body is killed. Or rather, what is it that is killed when a body is killed? This would include all the relations and histories that had left their traces in this body and that enabled it to always be more than a body and less than one. This is why the image Susan produced has to be considered in terms of the broader context or narrative into which its testimony is situated and in relation to how it is presented and by whom. This means, as Tom Keenan has argued in an essay on Alan Sekula's writings on the ambiguous documentary character of photography, that by itself, this is the last quote on the, passage, on the handout, the imprint of the trace decides nothing settles nothing, determines nothing, forces no conclusions. Conclusions, decisions happen in an altogether different realm and depend on differing presentational circumstances and conditions of use. This indeterminacy of meaning does not hold in spite of the indexicality of the image, but because of it. Because there is a trace, an imprint, there is the possibility of interpretation, the opportunity for meaning fiction, and hence the battleground of fictions. Because there is a trace, there is a battle. Around the image, a debate can begin. We decide what it says. It does not, it cannot, end quote. If the image of the father seeking to gather the remains of his son suggests the incapacity of the photograph to coincide with the photographed, this second image similarly points to the inability of the photograph to remain on the side of evidence all by itself. This is not to say that the photograph is not from the very beginning evidence, but simply to insist that we always need to state what it is evidence of. In both instances, the referential character of the photographic trace is unsettled, even if for different but related reasons. These are photographs, in other words, that not only tell us something about the moment at which they were taken and about the several histories that are sealed within that moment, but also about the structure and character of photography itself and about its capacity for decontextualizing its subjects. Indeed, this force of decontextualization belongs to the violence of all images, and perhaps particularly to the violence of images of violence, since violence is always accomplished in an image. In other words, and here we may follow Benjamin's own critique of violence, violence is registered when the production of its effects is indissociable from its manifestation. In his 1960 afterward, to dream tigers. Jorge Luis Borges writes of a man who sets out to draw the world. Over the years, he tells us, the man peopled a space with images of provinces, kingdoms, mountains, bays, ships, islands, fishes, rooms, instruments, stars, horses, and individuals. A short time before he dies, 
he discovers that that patient labyrinth of lines traces the image of his face, end quote. Borges imagines, Borges imagines a man who spends his life creating and collecting images, and who near the end of his life comes to understand that the various trajectories of his life trace the image, the lines, and the outline of his face offering, in a sense, a kind of self-portrait, but a portrait that, as a composite of everything he has seen and experienced, is never simply a portrait of just himself, but also of all the relations that have helped make him who he is, as the one who is never simply just himself. I want to close with this reference because I believe that among the many things Susan's photographs have given us is a portrait of everything she is someone who understands the relations that both constitute and deconstitute our sense of self, someone who understands that however difficult and even impossible it may seem to insist on memory, we must still imagine a means of remembering what remains without remaining. What, even if it is destroyed and ruined, even if it is in transit or passing before us, still demands to be preserved, even if within a history that can never enter into history. This obligation delineates the stakes of all of her photographic projects, and it also tells us why she believes that we must learn to read the past, and more precisely, the irretrievable images of the past, in a way that, following Walter Benjamin, knows how these images threaten to disappear as long as we do not recognize ourselves in them. This is why, as the Italian artist Salvatore Puglia would have it, what remains for us is to collect the fleeting images of what has disappeared, to recollect the floating fragments of this history of disappearance. What remains is the possibility of a gesture, to hand, to hold out, in the scattered memories to which we are condemned, some vestigia, some expressions of a multiple anamnesis." End quote. What remains are perhaps the remarkable gifts Susan has given us in all her photographs, each one of which hopes to open at least a door, if not many doors, so that we can perhaps learn to see a little better each day. It is because of her passion for justice, because of her courage to show what others often dare not show, that we remain indebted to her, to everything that her work has given us to think, and to everything she continues to give us. It is because of the grace and kindness with which she inhabits the world that we also can bear to inhabit it, that we can also find the strength to continue to try, as Emerson once said, to set one stone aright every day. Thank you. Um, Susan has talked about color um, in very specific contexts, um, but actually what's interesting about what you said in terms of the, the, let's say, the triptych that I put up is that, of course, the, the image of the cross is in black and white because the image of the cross is taken with the same roll of film that was, ta that was taking the, the family photo in upstate New York, right? And because that's the... the the trick of the project, right? You, you stay in the same roll of film. So she was using a black and white roll of film, and this is why both of those images are in black and white. And I mention that particularly because um, many of the Nicaragua images, of course, are in color. And she does talk about this. Uh, you know, it, it's not as if, uh, I mean, she's there. She, she goes to Nicaragua. She puts her body in another place to see what happens, right? She goes to Nicaragua. She's not commissioned to go there. She hears there's a revolution. She goes to document what's there to see what's happening. 
And it's not that she's thinking at any given moment because bullets are flying, people are being killed, the things are being shot. Oh, should I use color? Should I use black and white? Right? But at a certain point, she decides in that instance that color um, matches what she wants to convey about the, the energy and vibrancy of the revolution, that there's some way in which black and white doesn't capture that for her. So most of the images she takes, in fact, then, from that project are in color. So I think that for her, um, I, I like the idea that, um, I mean, what you said, that uh, the black and white allows one to pay, pay more attention to formal elements. And in fact, the Learn to See project is entirely in black and white. Um, it's out of print. Um, I had to get her assistant to scan it for me, send me a PDF. Uh, but Aperture has been interested um, for many years to reprint it. Uh, she's re been reluctant to reprint it, but now that I've shown an interest in it, it seems that she might want to reprint it. But Aperture doesn't want to reprint it as it was produced then. I mean, it was produced in a kind of spiral bound, low budget, like, to be used in a classroom, exercises, experiments. And so Aperture wants to update it. <laughs> They want to include digital exercises. Uh, they want to make it more global. Uh, these are all exercises uh, done in the States by people who were teaching in the States. They want to make it more global and they want to see, maybe draw examples from projects where people are using photography in the classroom to teach children how to see. So they want to expand it, make it larger. I imagine that in that context, uh, it's possible that some of the images will be in color. Yes. In your last quote from Thomas Keenan, uh, he uses the word indexicality of the image. Um, what's, what's your, how would you uh, define that, flesh that out? Well, I'm very glad you asked. <laughs> because I, I actually um, resist this word. Uh, you know, the, the, the word indexicality is, is a word that is very, um, significant and important within the discourse on photography theory and the theories of photography. They talk about uh, one of the things that makes uh, photography photography that, that has to do with the specificity of photography as opposed to other mediums uh, is its indexicality. And this is uh, what they mean by that is that a photograph, for example, is like a, it's, it marks the trace of something that was before the camera. It, it has an indexical relation like the, in the way, same way that a footprint has an indexical relation to the print it leaves in sand, right? Or, or um, uh, anything like that. A foot leaves an imprint. That imprint is an index of the foot. So this is how he's using it. Um, but indexicality for me is a much more complicated issue because, for example, um, in the, uh, oops. Oh, they just disappear and come back. No, that was me. That was, I, it comes back and then I mess it up, you know, so. Um. I like this one. Okay. Uh, but one of the things that, that I think that indexicality mass is the multiplicity of things that are sealed within a photograph. So, for example, um, you have a portrait of you. <laughs> it's me. It's just... No, I don't want to give it up. <laughs> uh, there. I'll just stand over here. <laughs> don't, don't touch anything, Kadava. Um, is that, let's say we have a, picture, a portrait of you. So most people would say that that portrait has an indexical relation to you. But what I would say is that that portrait has an indexical relation actually to all the faces that have gone into the making of your face. So that instead of it having an indexical relation to you, it has an indexical relation to the archive that your face is. So, so this complicates what the indexical is in a photograph. Usually you use an indexical to say that it's a photograph that references this. And what I'm saying is that the this is always multiple. So that, for example, in any of the images that I was reading, uh, let's say the, uh, the image of the cross, I'm saying that that image doesn't just index the cross, it's an image that also indexes the Cuesta del Plomo Torso, right? And then that image, because it requires, because she says that that image requires all the 71 images that are in the book that she puts in there to serve as a context for that image, then that torso 
indexes at least those 71 images. So in other words, for me, indexicality um, is, is a, a term that miniaturizes the, the context within which we should be reading images. Okay. Does that help? Thank oh. you very much. Thank you. Susan? Oh, so it, it was really very, I really enjoyed it, as you can imagine. But I also have a kind of puzzle. Uh, it's a puzzle about, I think, I think the question that's going to come out of it is, uh, what happens to what you are saying when you address it to her? When what? When you address it to her. You said at the beginning of your talk that it's a letter. It, it's a letter yes. to her. Yes. Uh, and of course, you gave it to us in a different form. And so because you're not Susan. <laughs> well, I am. But that's <laughs> you know, this was real. That was a great answer. <laughs> you know, you know, you two should become friends, and then we'll try and decide who's the narcissist. <laughs> okay, so, but, uh, so that's really my question, but it, 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 I want to give a little background to why that question to me is important, you know, important yes. to the kind of theory, theoretical claims you're, you're, you're making. Um, the, the, the difficulty of somehow um, putting together uh, Susan as artist, which is um, yeah, it, which is in the in the you know in the idiom of the artist in the right. and a lot of what you say is about her, right? And yet photography has this totally other side to it, which is uh, you know which where that with that role of the artist as subject just doesn't work. Right. So prior to photography, there is the, the, the kind of generation of the artist as subject who then is this creative force. Uh -huh. And photography cuts into that very, very strongly. And yet in your presentation... What do you mean cuts into it very, very strongly? Uh, it cuts against that. And, I mean, I'm talking about Benjamin on the distinction that, that it's wrong to try to make Photography be art. That's one of his points, right? That you know to, that it's it, it would be wrong to to subsume photography inside of art. It's doing something else. So I'm just sort of interested in how that uh, maybe I'm not making myself very clear, but how that that problem of the subject and object, right, or the objective nature of, or the whole idea of photography as lessons. In in looking and seeing, which is to me very uh, depersonalized, very much not in the notion of the artist. So I felt a certain tension in those two uh, potentialities of what you were saying. Okay. But the way I'm going to ask that question is, what happens to how you are describing what you're describing when you address it to another person? Okay. Let me tell, give you a little background on why I, wrote, why I wrote it in the form of a letter. Um, there's a point where, I mean, Susan has repeatedly said, and this I think touches on what you're saying, she would never consider herself an artist. She thinks of herself as a documentary photographer. She, doesn't, she wasn't in Nicaragua taking these images of the revolution, thinking that those images were going to go into a museum, right? I mean, she's trying to record what's happening at that moment. Um, but what's interesting in terms of her subjectivity, let's say, is um, Susan has repeatedly said that none of the photographs that she has ever taken are just hers. Right? She's, she's never claimed, she never claims that the images are her images, that she authors those images. Right? This is very interesting. I mean, it's a kind of parenthesis, and I'll return to this. Um, as a kind of parenthesis, uh, the image of the massacre of El Mozote uh, f uh, about a year ago was being used in a trial in El Salvador against one of the people who had been involved in the massacre. And Susan had to fly down. Susan, of none of these images are ever mine fame, <laughs> has to fly to El Salvador and go to court and say, this is my image, this is what I saw, this is what I took with my camera. Because that's the only way for that image to be entered in the courtroom as evidence. Okay. But that's a parenthesis. So this, this interest in uh, 
I mean, my sense of that line when she says, the, none of these images are ever just mine, resonated with me um, in a project that is, that is also going to have something to do with what you're saying. It's a project that is done by Marcelo Brodsky, uh, the Argentinian photographer, mostly known for his work on the disappeared. Um, because he's always identified with the disappeared, uh, he decides to do a different kind of project that, to try and sidestep the disappeared. He's unable to, it still gets in there and so on. But what he does is he um, initiates a series of what he calls visual correspondences. And these are correspondences that he engages in with photographers and artists. He sends a photograph to the photographers and artists. The photographers reply with a photograph. The artist replies with a, a drawing. He then replies to the photograph or drawing with another photograph, and they keep going. 40, 50 uh, images, I mean exchanges. That's another exchange. Uh, and that's a correspondence. So uh, he invites me to write about the correspondences. So I, I invite a former student of mine, a friend of mine, to enter into a correspondence with me about the correspondences. And here's the argument, because it's very related to what you're asking. Um, the very first correspondence that Marcelo engages in is with the Catalonian photographer Manuel Esclusa. So during the dictatorship in Argentina, Marcelo goes into exile to Barcelona. He studies photography with Manuel. So Manuel is his teacher. So when he initiates the, the exchange with the visual correspondence with Manel, he sends an image to Manel. Because Manel is his teacher, was his teacher, in some sense that image is coming from Manel. Right? So if you think about a, a theory of correspondence, my theory of correspondence is in fact you can't send a letter to anyone unless you've already received something from that person. So in other words, he can't send an image to Manel unless he's already received something from that person, which is to say that his image is never just his. Right? I mean, Marcelo's eyes, you could never say Marcelo's eyes are just Argentinian because his eyes have been composed in part by the eyes of a Catalonian whose eyes in turn have been composed by someone French, someone German, someone English, etc. So how do you then start talking about authorship in that kind of a context? So because, because Susan says, none of these images are ever just mine, which is why she always returns, why she always gives images, why she doesn't keep them, why she goes and finds people. She's very involved with the people of whom, I mean, who she takes a picture. But this, this line, every photograph I take is never just mine, for me resonates with this, this structure of correspondence where the letter I write begins in the destination. The letter's not just mine. Right? So, I write it in the form of a letter. And one of the other reasons has to do with, uh, because I, I, I think that allows me to play with this idea of something that, in other words, I can't write to her unless I've already received something from her work. In other words, what makes it possible for me to write to her has been my relation engagement with her work. So it's a way of staging that performatively. Right? Um, the other thing is that uh, um, she, as I'm writing, uh, beginning to write, she sends me a link to an invitation, I mean a link that documents a, uh, an event that she had engaged in in London. She's invited by um, a gallery in London to participate in this kind of fabulous uh, uh, project. Um, it's called Desert Island Picks. And they invite famous photographers to go to London and for an hour talk about the eight photographs they would most want to take to a desert island if that's where they're going. Right? This is a fabulous uh, thing. I would love to participate in this. Um, but what, what Susan didn't know is that this is how I always think about my writing on photography. When I receive a body of work, and I get an invitation to write on this body of work, I like to imagine I'm on a desert island. And all I have is this body of work. And on the basis of this body of work, I have to invent a theory of photography, memory, perception, history, etc. So what is it that this work allows me to say? So all of a sudden, I, you know, this is what I do. I, I write a letter to her for the reasons I've explained. And I imagine that I'm on a desert island and all I have is her work. And, and in that, I have to invent, I have to see what this work allows me to do. And what I do is I take five of the projects from Learn to See with me to the desert island. And then I see what I can do with them. Thank you. Oh, um, can I just, uh, I think just follow right up on, on Susan's, this Susan's 
this is, <laughs> that's just his point. Um, and I, I wanted to, to maybe press you a little bit more about the, the, this idea of the status of the photographer as someone who's privileged and talented in the, the capacity, the power of seeing. Um, and I wanted again to specifically press that point on the uh, regarding the, 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 the photographic documentation of atrocity scenes, uh, both in the, their, um, their narratives quality, but also their legal forensic quality. I mean, so um, as, as I'm sure you know, I mean, there's, there's a real sharp divide in uh, the, the role of photography in documenting for forensic purposes. Um, atrocity crimes, it comes right around 2005, 2008, and it has to do with a tipping point in the saturation of cell phones in vulnerable populations, both in terms of perpetrators and victims, but also certainly in terms of, of bystanders. And so, if you look at something like Emma Zote, all the way up through to the turn of the millennium, um, a lot of the forensic documentation of atrocities is by photojournalists, often Western photojournalists who've traveled to the Global South to do this. Uh, that changes abruptly and totally, so that now if you, uh, in not everywhere, but in many, many um, places that have experienced atrocity crimes, um, it's, uh, it's victims and perpetrators and bystanders who are saturating uh, the internet with uh, digital, uploaded digital film clips and images of the um, uh, of the atrocity, and so I, I suppose that must undermine or at least confuse a little bit the, the, the distinction between the photographer and the victim, or the photographer and the perpetrator, because everybody's taking pictures of everything. Well, what do you mean about the, uh, confusing the uh, photographer with either victim or perpetrator? Because, I mean, it seems to me that the distinction that you're depending on is that Susan is neither victim or perpetrator. She's some third thing. She's a seer. And what I'm saying is, is that in the way that um, photography works in the fields that I work in. What is the field you work in? Uh, atrocity prevention. Uh -huh. um, the, the, the big task is to develop software algorithms that will in real time vet the authenticity of uploaded digital uh, phot photographic images so that one can figure out in, in actionable terms, is this uh, the image actually verifiably an image of what the poster that the uploader says it is. Whether it's a selfie of perpetrators, which is very, very common now, um, a, a, a picture of the aftermath of atrocity crimes, or in fact an uploaded a video clip of the atrocity taking place. Right. So, I don't, I don't want to change the subject here, but I, but, I think, subject. but I do wonder about what happens to this idea of the distinction between these different groups, the seer and the scene, once the, everybody's a photographer, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I mean, I, I'm usually somebody who likes saying, like, everything is this, everything is that. I, I really don't have any problem saying these things. Um, but, but I think that uh, I, I don't, Susan is a photographer in a different way, I think, than many other photographers are photographers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think that one of the things that, I mean, first of all, I, I'm, I'm not only aware of the way in which the, the cell phone is now being used and things, but I'm, I'm also engaged in projects that, that use these things. So I, I collaborate with Al Wiseman from the Forensic Architecture Agency, um, and uh, we've um, done a project in the Amazon, I mean, actually, uh, the Conflict Shoreline Project. We did uh, work in the Amazon, we're doing work in the Negev, uh, we're going to go to the Canadian Arctic. Um, and uh, we were having trouble, actually, in the project in Nega. We were going to go, and this is linked to what you're talking about. Um, we were going to visit one of the unrecognized Bedouin villages in the Negev. And um, before we made the trip with the students, um, the Israeli police had killed one of the Bedouin uh, teachers in the village. And the uh, Israeli police were claiming, in fact, that uh, he was driving a car toward them. They warned him. He didn't stop. They shot. Uh, he kept going, and they finally had to shoot him again. There's cell footage, footage. There's cell, cell phone footage documenting what happened. And there are other ways of 
of also doing gun, uh, gun sound signatures and you know, timing everything. And, and so the multiplicity of the, of the cell phone images is actually something you can coordinate it and, and um, mobilize. Get, you, you, can, you can mark the signature of a moment by having different images and, and uh, coordinating the angles and everything. Um, these, this work then eventually, of course, uh, showed that the Israeli police were lying. Um, they had to issue a formal apology. Um, the other recent one, though, that was worked on, which is more directly linked to what you're talking about, I think, is um, this just was reported in the New York Times. The Forensic Architecture Agency did a diagnosis of the uh, Syrian bomb and showed that, in fact, it was a chemical bomb. Uh, but what they also showed, and actually somebody told me that this wasn't in the uh, newspaper account. I don't know if, if you could confirm that, but in the New York Times account of this discovery, that in fact it was a chemical weapon when they did, that they didn't say that the White Helmet Group had manipulated the evidence, even though it was a chemical bomb. Right? They had they had sent uh, images and, and so on. Also, in we had, they had images from the White Helmet Group, from which is the the group that was going after Assad, uh, that it was a chemical bomb but they even manipulated the evidence even though it was already known that it was a chemical bomb. So what you're talking about in terms of the veracity of, of the images is something that has to be really carefully looked at, right? But in terms of what, what you want to see in terms of the difference between these two things, I mean, I, I think that what cell phones, what digital media and so on do is they intensify something that was always already possible with the analog camera. And, and you know, Susan works both with analog and digital. But this is to say that um, if you, um, you know, I don't think it matters, is what, I, this is what I'm thinking, is it doesn't matter uh, how, I'm trying to think of which would be the best example. Um, okay, a bombing, a bombing in, in the West Bank, in the occupied territories. Uh, the cloud of smoke goes up. You have hundreds and thousands of cell phone images of those clouds. But the cloud itself is very singular at any given moment, right? I mean, it, it's so that you can actually not only time, but you can, you can, if you coordinate all the images that are coming from different places, you can start, if you use a kind of dial and the sun and where it's going, you can actually time the bombing using thousands of different cell phone images. You know, none of which are, are always sourceable, but you have all these images together and you map them and you can then mark the signature of a cloud of what shape it was at this particular time and you can know. So this is, seems to me that something that, that, of course, Susan can't do unless she's right there at that time in that moment, right? So this is something that the multiplicity of the images seems to allow something that she wouldn't be able to do because she's a single person. I don't know if this is what you're trying to get at or not, but I think that... Um, I, what I wanted to say is that it's not clear to me that you need to know in advance, in every instance, whether or not that image is reliable or not. Because I think that when you have thousands of images that you're collating from off the web, which is what forensic architecture does, right, they gather tens of thousands of images just to document one event, and then they start coordinating, mapping, confirming, sound signatures of guns, et cetera, putting all the other kinds of information together in addition to the images is one of the things that I'm trying to say. The images themselves are never enough. They have to be supplemented by other kinds of materials, uh, sound signatures, narratives, et cetera. And it's that kind of work, which I think is also work that has to be done with Susan's images, but that what's done with the, with the multiplicity of images, which is kind of, it's a, it's a field of images, let's say, that those fields of images don't have to be um, locatable in order to be useful. I don't know if this makes sense. This is something different. I mean, for Susan, you have the location. She's there. She has to say, I'm there. I took this image. For the other image, it's just gathering off the internet. This is what forensic architecture does. It just gathers tens of thousands of images off the internet. And then it starts trying to map them and coordinate them and add other kinds of material to it. So the work that has to be done is similar, but I think the scale is completely different. But I still don't think that this issue of the veracity of the image plays as much a role if you're looking at tens of thousands of images versus whether you're looking at a few images. Maybe that's the difference. I don't know. This I'll have to think more about. Yes, yeah,
My question, which is really abstract, builds off your prior talk, um, where you gave us several examples of, of Darvish and, and how his poetry makes a recourse to the language of photography. Uh -huh. And in this talk, um, you talked about the visual correspondences or, or visual rhymes between certain photographs. And so I'm wondering how photography might make recourse to poetry, or in what ways is a photograph like a poem, or in what ways is a photograph a poem, also a poem? Um, could you speak a little bit about the direction the other way? The other way. Um, I was recently asked this in an interview, and I can't even remember what I said. But, but um, you know, th there are moments, of course, uh, there are photographs that, that take their point of departure from literature, right? So you have Jeff Wall's Invisible Man, right, where he has a picture of an African American in a room full of light bulbs. Um, this happens from the 19th century onward. Um, you have the uh, images of Tennyson, the Idols of the King, uh, done by Cameron. Uh, so there, there are lots of uh, moments when photography takes its point of departure from literature, let's say. I mean, literally takes its point of departure from literature. Um, I think that there's a, a way in which, depending on the photographer, there are certain photographers that are, are trying to, let's say, um, be less realistic uh, and are therefore more allegorical, more poetical in their practice. Um, but I think that one of the things that I would say too, and, and this w would be bringing together last the last week's colloquium with today's uh, lecture, um, Susan would, never, would always think of herself as a documentary photographer. Fazl does not think of himself as a documentary photographer, right? I mean, and Fazl is documenting. He's, he's taking portraits. He's uh, documenting uh, devastations in different human rights contexts, but he doesn't think of himself as a documentary photographer, and I think this is why he, he more readily incorporates uh, photography, narratives, other kinds of testimonials into his work. So uh, on the one hand, uh, on a literal level, there are projects, photographic projects that take their point of departure from literature, that use literature, that try and stage scenes of literature. Morel's uh, Alice in Wonderland would be another example. There are tons of them. Um, but I think that if one wants to talk about photography itself as a literary gesture, then I think that what one has to do is not only um, talk about the way in which the the language of photography uses tropes, but the way in which the camera itself uh, decontextualizes something, right? Because this is what, when I say that you have to read, that to read a, a, a photograph historically, you have to do those two things that I described last week simultaneously, contextualize but also decontextualize, it's in that force of decontextualization that you can begin to use the photograph as an allegory of photography itself. And it's in that decontextualization movement that I think um, the photograph gets closer to being literary, let's say, because it, it moves away from presumably what's before the camera. I mean, it takes its point of departure from what's before the camera, but not for the sake of explaining what's before the camera, but rather for the sake of trying to say something about the nature of photography in general. Yeah, Heather, Bayan, then these two, I don't know who's, maybe somebody else should do it again, yeah. I'll just stand up so that skipped in here, but um, yeah, so actually around this question of literature, I wonder if uh, maybe it would be good to make a distinction between poetry and prose um, or uh, narrative is another term that came right. up. Um, right. And uh, because I, I think I'm still kind of struggling with your injunction to contextualize and decontextualize. Um, and even with Susan's claim to be a document, I mean, actually the kind of indistinction in a way between these two photographers that you've talked about. Um, and I mean, the aesthetic impulse both in her photography and also in her reading of her photography is so strong. And it is more in the mode of poetry, that's to say, like a visual rhyme, than it is necessarily in the mode of, uh, of discourse or narrative or construction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I'm just, my question is, I think, if I had to put it <laughs> straightforwardly, which I'm not doing, but would be something like, is there a distinction between seriality and narrative? Um, because in a way, the injunction to contextualize, to me, is the narrative discursive element, which is about everything that's gone, you know, the archival impulse, everything that's gone into the, right, right. the photograph. But there's something about the seriality and the ability to see resemblances 
um, which is radically decontextualizing yeah. and aestheticizing, um, but which also extends into the future, too. And that was an interesting, you know, you're such a historical, deeply historical thinker and theorist, and yet there's something about that kind of future horizon that the image will be in relation to something that is, we don't know what that is yet, right? And so the kind of creative impulse, or even I was thinking about a lot in relation to the um, alphabetography project, right? Which is that, of course, children won't be able to see letters without the whole history of human language, but you're also training them, them into a kind of um, gestalt ability to see something that doesn't exist yet, right? And that, that sort of pulls against, I think, this kind of you know, it's always about the history, it's always about what goes into it. Right. Um, and that to me is a kind of rhyme that extends into the future as opposed to the history and the narrative that informs the photograph. So I just, I mean, it was great to have you just say in response to this question, contextualize and decontextualize simultaneously. I think I'm just struggling because it's like impossible to do both of those things. It's impossible to do them both at the same time. This is true. but, but. Um, but I do think this is actually what one needs to do. One needs to do that. It's not enough simply to contextualize, um, because you have to see what this photograph is doing in relation to the context. It transforms the context very often. So it's, it wouldn't be enough just to reconstitute the context. You have to see what's idiomatic in, in relation to this photograph, I say, in the, the idiomatic relation this photograph has to the context that it's trying to dis discuss because it has an idiomatic relation. That idiomatic relation has to do with the moment which is taken, but also has to do with that force of decontextualization, which is just to say that every photograph rips something out of a context. Um, it, I mean, I, I had not thought about this um, relation between seriality and narration. I think what I would say is that I'm talking about ser the seriality of, of photographs. It's to say that there's no photograph that ever appears alone. It always appears in a serial, in, in a series. Um, so that the, the images that I, I read last, last week, uh, they're, they're, it's literally a series, it's three volumes, right? So you have to read them syntactically in relation to each other within the single volume, but then also across volumes, right? But that seriality is, is a seriality that, that not only occurs across different images, but it's a seriality that, that belongs to the structure of the photograph itself. So that the photograph itself, every photograph itself is fissured from within by its own seriality. Right? And so, does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay. And that's like the contact sheet, and that's formal and it's material, but I'm not sure it's necessarily historical. I mean, there's something. No, but it is if, if you, you know, so that I, I have the picture of the, the cross. And I'm saying that that's an image, it's, it's in a series. It's, a, it's certainly in a series in terms of the diptych, but I'm actually saying that the series even extends back to the 1979 image. Right? So that you have to, I mean, to read the context in an image, you have to read what's not visible in the surface, but which nevertheless has left its traces on that surface. But you do need Susan for that, I mean, to speak to the kind of algorithmic um, cloud, you know, the cloud yeah. of images of the cloud. Um, you actually, I mean, the, the, she is the connector there, right? And it's not yeah. that. Just as I'm the connector between the two projects, between Susan and Fazel, right? I mean, so, so there's not, I mean, one of the reasons that you're seeing uh, a relation between them is because I'm doing the readings, right? Because it's not so clear that Fossil and Susan would say they, their practice is similar. I think they would, they would not, in fact, say that the practice is similar. So I think that what, what I liked about your question is that, that what I'm interested in is, is thinking about the, the seriality of the image, which is to say it's placed within a series of images, but also the seriality that is inside uh, the image itself. And that seriality is, is not about succession, I said, but it's also about interruption, right? And so narrative comes in as a means of trying to invent a story that allows one to put together images taken at different places and different times. And how do you do that? And how do you measure that narrative? And, and how do you, I mean, what I'm trying to do is give an example of how one would go about doing that, right? Uh, but I think that there's a difference between seriality and narrative. It's almost as if narrative is going to be the thing that tries to fill in the gaps with, with the series, right? So, so this is also, dangerous, right? because in some sense what you want is a narrative that would give an account of why these images are together, while also at the same time respecting the interruptive character of the sequence. Right, right. I'll I'm think more sure about that too. Yeah. 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 Um, I guess this sort of follows up on the last questions, but I'm curious about like what, um, 
like you make a very compelling case about like how to think about images historically or photographically. Um, I had to think of photographs historically, but what, is, what, would, what would it mean to sort of like flip it and go the other way and sort of use this theory of photography to think history? I mean, it's a, it's a little bit like a reformulation of Heather's question with a slightly different. No, this is what I this is what I do in some sense, right? I, I um, in the, I mean the example of the the Emerson book, and then the example of the the Benjamin book. I'll give the, the two examples, right? One of the, what I do in the Emerson book is I look at uh, Emerson's recourse to meteorological and climatic metaphors when he talks about history. In the belief that the metaphors that somebody use, uses to talk about history says something about what they think history is. Same with Benjamin. I, I'm interested in his recourse to the language of photography when he talks about history. Because he's interested in, in the way in which historical events emerge when the, the, the linearity or continuum of, of presentation of history is interrupted. Right? He thinks that the catastrophe is that history always goes on in the same way as it always has. So a historical event can only happen when that line is interrupted. So he, this is why he privileges the, the language of arrest, uh, immobility, uh, interruption, etc. Right? And so that the, the use of, the, of photography is use of photography as a kind of technology, but also as a lever, a kind of metaphor to open up a whole series of questions about what it means to do history, right? So that um, history in that instance is something that, that emerges, a historical event emerges uh, through a force of interruption, right? Of that continuum of history. So I think that, that it's, it's linked. I, I don't think I'm doing anything different. Or at least I have also done that. <laughs> yes. Uh, barely. Okay, so uh, I'll try to speak as yes. loud as possible. Now, my question is uh, about this uh, in the desire of defining also photography in, uh, uh, in itself, so let's say, trying to also achieve the sort of ontology of what is a photograph. Okay, so now I'm not hearing you, so maybe. No, um, it's okay, so I'll. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, what you're also trying to do always is to uh, stress the importance of reading a, a photograph historically. And also at the beginning, you also mentioned that our history mediates our own uh, perceptions. So my question is how to convey this uh, historical sensitivity and also the desire of defining uh, photography in ontological terms in itself. For example, I'm thinking at the phrase of uh, I, I believe the reality says that uh, new modes of uh, technology they determine uh, new modes of perceptions, uh, new technologies, and this is something that we find also in pain, I mean, in legal and so on. So, in the moment that uh, <clears throat> new technologies they change our perceptions, consequently, uh, is not also photography in its ontological sense uh, uh, changed historically? I don't know if I was able to articulate uh, the question enough. I mean, you're, you're just asking me to talk about the way in which um, perception is historical and the way in which perception is historical precisely in relation to the technological apparatuses that are available for vision. Yeah, and in the moment, if we accept this uh, 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 overall uh, uh, idea, can we really produce or propose an, an ontological definition of photography or not? How do we convey these two aspects to um, well, look, I mean, Patty in her introduction quoted a line uh, from the Itinerant Languages Photography Project where one of the things that I say um, is that a photography, I mean, the only thing that we know with, from the history of photography is that photography has never been a single thing. It's never been a single thing. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's incorporated other mediums, it, it's gone through different uh, stages of development, um, and, and so the, the technology itself has never been a single thing, I mean, in relation to photography. Uh, I do believe, of course, that, that um, as technologies change, perception can change. I mean, this is what, as you said, ben, from Benjamin to Derrida, perception is historical. This is what Benjamin says in the work of art essay. Um, but I think my interest is, is in developing this idea that one of the things that is most urgent is to encourage people to learn how to read historically, especially in moments of danger. It's not only because I think we live in a moment of danger, but it's also because I think, as Mohali Naj suggests in the early 1930s, that the illiteracy of the future will not be of reading and writing, but of photography. 
right? That there's a, a sense already in the 30s that uh, there's a proliferation of images, illustrated magazines, newsreels, photography, uh, mobilization of the technical media, et cetera. And what uh, people from Krakow to Benjamin are suggesting is that this proliferation is um, bombarding us with what they call a flood or blizzard of photographs that in fact uh, produce a strike against understanding. We're so saturated with images that we can't really have time to think about them. So that Krakow will say that we've never lived in a world uh, that has known so much about itself if knowing about itself means having a photograph of everything. Right? But then we're so bombarded by these images that these images produce an amnesia uh, to the historical context in which they're being produced, a, a strike against understanding. And by the time he gets to the end of the paragraph, he says, we've never lived in a world that has known so little about itself. Now, so having an image in your hand is not the same as grasping the world within your understanding. Right? So I think that one of the things that I'm, I'm just trying to suggest is that what, what seems urgent to me is uh, to teach people how to read historically. I think this is extremely important. Um, and it's, a, it's an activist form of reading. Uh, it's a way of trying to take what one inherits, um, move it somewhere else, and try to do different kinds of work. Right? Because one of the things that the suggestion would be that if one wants to change things, one has to change the way in which people view things. Right? So this is a way of, of trying to do this. The Visual Correspondences Project is a project like that. Uh, these are projects like that. Fossil's projects are like that. But you know, I'm the one who's saying these are projects like that. You know, it's not that they would say that this is a project like that from the beginning. Right? So that what interests me are those photographers who, whose work permits me to say these things when I'm on my desert island. You know, I'm on my desert island. They allow me to say these things. You know, so what I like about Fossil's work, if you were there last week, you remember, is that what I liked about Fossil's work is that his work is, is the work of a human rights photographer who wants to show things, but his work always includes a meditation on the possibility, the difficulty, and sometimes impossibility of showing things. And I think that's extremely smart. Right? So I, I don't know if this, I mean, it broaches it, but... Uh, yeah. Thank you, I have uh, two questions great questions about um, crisis and the archives. So you, you've said a number of times that it's important to read historically moments of crisis. You just call it a danger. What are, how do I know a crisis when I see it? I, I was born in 94 and I feel like I've been living in moments of crisis my whole life. So yeah. Here I can be very specific. I mean, um, when, I, when I talk about reading historically in moments of danger, I'm using danger in a strictly Benjaminian sense. Right? And what Benjamin means by danger is the always present possibility that without your knowing it, you can become a tool of the oppressors. Right? So that what he's, what he's, danger is the always present possibility of political complicity. That, you, th that you, you think you're doing this over here, and without your knowing it, you're actually reinforcing what you think goes in the direction of the worst. This, this, is, what, this is always possible precisely because you use a language that isn't just yours. And that language bears history in it. That language has been used for many different kinds of things. And so that when you use that language, it carries the traces of all the uses that it's been put to. Right? So I, I can give you a very quick telegraphic example. Um, Paul Ceylan has a, a poem called Mit Brief und Ur, with letter and clock. Right? And it's a poem where he wants to awaken us to the dangers of the rhetoric of awakening. Uh, because because he's, he's, he's going after the rhetoric of awakening that was at the heart of, of National Socialism. Germany awake, uh, uh, etc. Right? This was the, the slogan, Deutschland uh, erwache. Right? So what he does is he, he has to use the German language. He's writing a poem in German, but he has this anxiety that the German language has been used to murder millions of people. So what does he do? He doesn't even want to use the language of awakening because that language has been the language that has also hurt people. So he begins the poem with the word vox. Wax, right? Um, Vox, of course, is something that is in almost Erwache, all these words that have to do with uh, growing and awakening and so on. So what he does is he uses words that evoke the sound of those metaphors of growing and, and awakening and so on without using the words. And he's asking us to hear those other words as if we were listening to a secret. And if we can't hear those other words, we have too much wax in our ears. Right? But, but it's this kind of amazing thing where, where he's, he's, he knows that this is language that has been, but he, can't st he still can't stop using it. 
right? He has to still use the German language, right? He can't just as, they have to still use these technical media, right? Which have been used for other, other things. But you, you use this language and you, you try and d dislocate it, recontextualize it and move it somewhere else, right? Without, you use it without using it in some way, if that's possible. But the moment you use it, you run the risk of reinforcing things without your knowing it. But this is the risk of reform. There's no risk without that. I mean, there's no reform without that risk. There's no outside, there's no safety zone. You can, you can only dislocate something from within. The moment you think you're outside, evaluating, judging, uh, escaping, that's when you're going to be taken from behind by history. Okay. Uh, um, I'll try to be really, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Um, I'll try to be really fast, but I think this question is a bit of a return to Whitney's and Heather's, so sorry for the whiplash. Um, but it seems like your, your kind of interest in, in putting these photographs into a narrative or in contextualizing them as we decontextualize them is, is in part a way to um, put a language how people make sense of the photographs, right? So like a, a way that you kind of construct a subject. Um, and Whitney's question, you know, when she asked, you know, what, how, how is photography, how is poetry used in photography, just made me think of, um, like, lyric, uh, lyric poetry and the kind of speaking eye um, as being somehow analogous to what we've been talking about in terms of how perception kind of reproduces, like, photograph reproduces the perception of a subject. Um, so I'm just kind of interested, like, in kind of returning to what seems on one hand this idea that for you, you know, narrative has this ability to kind of reconstitute the subject or reconstitute the uh, witness of the event, um, where it also seems like the kind of speaking eye of a, a piece of poetry could also kind of do that thing, much in the, both in the same way that you think of a photograph as reproducing a sort of cognitive perception of the world. If that makes any sense. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think what, one of the things that I'm hearing makes me think that I need to maybe at least nuance something, which is the use of the word narrative. Um, because I think that, that um, you know, if you look at discourses on, on photography, they're almost always written in sections, right? There, there isn't a straight, I mean, okay, there are very few people, but, but a lot of the, the strongest um, writings on photography are all written in sections, in theses, right? And it's a way of replicating formally uh, the, the experience of looking at a series of snapshots, right? So there's a way in which they stage within the movement of their writing what they want to convey about the nature of photography. Uh, interruptive, uh, I mean, if you're writing in sections, it's the best way within writing to interrupt writing, right? Because it's in sections, right? So I, what I'm saying when I talk about a narrative, I mean, that's why I did specify that it has to be a narrative that is, it still remains faithful to that interruptive character of the photograph. So it's not something that, it's something that tries to make sense out of how these images are put together, but it makes sense of it by still paying attention to the interruptive character of the photograph. This would be a, a, a narrative that isn't like the narratives that would try and smooth things over, let's say. Um, but if, if, I, if I understood that correctly then, um, maybe what you were saying is that, is there a relation or difference between the way in which a photograph tries to make meaning in the way in which the narrative makes meaning? Is this what you were trying to talk about? Yeah, well, but, and both kind of in the relation, the way that they kind of try to reproduce uh, what we think of as kind of reality. So the way that the photograph um, kind of cites an imagined vision. So when you like, look at it, you see, and the way that, like, say, the speaker in a poem, uh, you know, cites uh, an imagined situa like, situation that Hi, I'm speaking now. Um. Right, right. Well, you see, the, the, what I'm saying in, in this instance is if you have a photograph like the one of the cross, the second image in the diptych, and if we say, what is the reality that that image is referencing? One could say, a, a cross on the hillside in Nicaragua. But I'm saying that's not enough, right? This is an image that has sealed within it other references, right? It's, it, that image is not just an image of a cross, it's an archive. It's an archive of an unforeseeably mediated set of relations uh, that have to do with the history of everything that took place in that site. Just as when you're looking at the torso of the, the Costa del Plomo torso, uh, I, I, at one point, in, and I think it's a strong way to put it, that the real caption of that image is that torso. Right? That's the thing that, has to, that, that tells us what's happening. 
And to read that torso, you have to reconstruct all the history that made that torso appear there at that, at that moment, right? It, it, there, those histories are sealed within that body. And so that, uh, I'm saying this to say that when you think about an image presenting a reality, the question is, what is the reality that's being presented? And what I'm saying is that what's being presented is not simply a flat surface, but an archive, right? Uh, uh, several archives, many worlds, many histories, many relations are sealed within that photograph. So you could say a photograph presents what's before the camera, but then that's just the beginning of the mystery. What is it that's before the camera? Right? It's, it's much, that's why I say that, there, that there's much more in the photograph always than what you can see and there's always never enough in the photograph, right? Because it doesn't, it, it doesn't show you. You have to learn to read what's not visible on the surface. But as I said, which nevertheless has left its traces on that surface. And I think you do the same thing when you read a poem, when you read a text. You have to put that language in relation to other language, which is to say you have to contextualize it. But you have to show what's idiomatic in the way in which this language is using the language it inherits. Because it's not necessarily just repeating it in the same way. It could be distorting, displacing, changing, altering, and you can begin to read the politics of what someone is doing in accordance with the transformations that that person makes in the language he or she inherits. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.